welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced by North Idaho College located on Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. Our topic today is the environment, a review of the management of forest fires. It is a special privilege on behalf of our panel and our staff to welcome to the program Dr. Stephen Pine. He is a professor of history at Arizona State University and he's on a, a tour in our area and we're delighted he stopped by our studio for this interview. Our guest holds a BA degree from Stanford University, an MA and PhD degrees from the University of Texas at Austin. Our guest has also received the very distinguished MacArthur Foundation Award and in 1995, the Los Angeles Times Robert Kirsch Award. Our guest is an author, and among his books are one, Fire in America, by, uh, published at the University of Washington Press, a second book called The Ice, also University of Washington Press, and How the Canon Canyon Became Great, Viking Publication, or Penguin. Uh, Dr. Pine, welcome to the program. It's a thank you for taking time to be with us. We're very interested in the subject, and people in this area certainly are. Yeah and I'm sure that they'll find it most uh, informative. Well, thank you for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. And as always, I'm very pleased <coughs> to have Janelle Burke, an attorney in the state of Idaho, and a regular panelist, and we'll invite Janelle to start today's questioning. Dr. Pine, uh, Steve, if we might, sure. um, uh, you've been a firefighter, so you know something about fire firsthand. Where have you been a firefighter? In what locations? Well, I started on a fire crew at the North Rim of Grand Canyon few days after I graduated from high school. And, I, uh, and I, just for the uh, uh, benefit of our viewing audience, the, the North Rim does have trees, right? Oh yes, no, it's, uh, it's eight to 9,000 feet. It uh, starts at a pine forest and moves into a dense spruce fir, mixed conifer forest. Uh, lots of fires, uh, relatively rich in rain for Arizona, high elevation. Uh, it was a great life. I spent 15 summers in all doing that. and. Uh, Everything I write now essentially goes back to those experiences. So. Where else were you a firefighter? Well, not a firefighter. I spent uh, two summers at Rocky Mountain National Park trying to rewrite a fire plan for them. And then in 85, three years before the big fires, I spent a summer at Yellowstone trying to do the same without much success. But, <laughs> but now you've had a lot of experience, and so you have some theories about forest fires. Uh, what is your kind of basis hmm. of your your beliefs with regard to fire management in forests? Well, gosh, that's a huge question. Um, I'm often asked, what is the fire problem in the West and what do we do with it? And the, the first reply, I think, is that there are many fire problems in the West. And we need to break them down. Some of them are fairly easy to solve if we choose to. We can keep houses from burning up if we want. And we have a serious problem. Um, the last 10 years, it has been more or less uh, a dominant problem for the federal agencies and fire community, what to do with this intermixing of houses and wildlands. But that has technical solutions. I mean, you put the right kind of roof in, you do some basic maintenance around the house, you put roads, you provide essential protection. That is fixable within standards. What to do with fire in wilderness areas, roadless areas, much, much more difficult. There's, there's no obvious solution to that. That's a cultural a political choice. What to do with all the forests, particularly the lower elevation forests like Ponderosa Pine that had historically for very long periods of time experienced very frequent light surface fires. Now that forest has so changed in large extent because of the exclusion of fire that fires that get into it have a very different character and the forests are in many ways a mess. Those are all different kinds of problems and, and we need to approach them differently. I want to pursue the same line of questioning. Forests vary in uh, their composition around America, so other parts of the world. I came originally from the east, and the forests are totally different here. The rainfall is yeah. different and so forth. So in dealing with management of our forests and also trying to prevent certain disasters, and uh, we'll talk about one of those in a, in a few minutes, uh, should we have different management policies based upon the terrain and and, and the type of uh, forest yeah. that we have. Yeah, absolutely. And in one way, talking about what the role of fire is, is 
to misstate the question um, because um, the, the first issue is whether there is a natural basis for fire or not. The northeastern United States has no natural basis for fire. There's no wetting and drying cycle that annually or mm -hmm. very frequently occurs. There's no dry lightning to start it. So if people are gone, take people out of New Hampshire, you're not going to have any fires. It's very simple. That's not the case in the West. You have the conditions for a natural fire. So even if you remove people, some kind of fire is going to come Things in. Things like lightning. That's right. There's going to be natural ignition. But we shouldn't be talking, other than that broad category, within the realm of fire, you want to talk about what kind of patterns fire makes or what fire regime results. And what we've seen happen in the West is that we still have fire, as we did historically, even before, if you can imagine the time before people, there would have been fire. But the pattern or regime of the fire has changed. Now, the forest has adapted itself to a prevailing common pattern of fire. If you change that regime, the forest is no longer adapted uh, to the fires that occur. So it's not whether you have fire or not. It's very much the character of the fire. And then we, we need to recognize that fire is not an element, Aristotle not with, notwithstanding. It's a reaction. And it only takes, it, it synthesizes its surroundings. It, it takes its, its character from the context in which it exists. So if you have messed up forests, you get messed up fires. If you have grasslands, you get, you get a certain kind of fire. If you have a pine savanna, you get a different kind of fire. If you have a closed canopy lodgepole pine forest, you will get a different kind of fire again. So if you're going to think about fire, you need to be specific. You need to think about these kinds of issues. And the only kind of solutions that have any meaning are site-specific. I mean, these general principles, these broadcast arguments are, are just, these are theological discussions. Uh, is, has that been a problem with our national policies that they've tried, or am I wrong, <coughs> have they tried to have a, a, a policy that fits all, and in, in, in your comment that cannot be? That's right, um, except in the most general sense, which in a, in a way is meaningless. Um, the, these sort of categorical principles have been a mistake. and, and for a variety of historical reasons, and my particular orientation on the subject is as a historian, one can see how a kind of universal single standard was developed for the federal lands, particularly the Forest Service, and then through them for the others. And that was promulgated as a universal criteria. And that caused, I think everyone would have to admit, a great deal of damage. Thank you. Janelle Burke. I know that there are a large number of people who are going to be very interested in the forests around this area. Um, there are a large number of people, of course, who live in the forest. So let's talk a little bit about those forests where there are both people living and there are also forest lands around the area. What do you recommend or what do you advocate? or How do you look at that forest? Well, it's a, it's a case of looking at the forest, but also a case of looking at the developments. And uh, most of the forests that people inhabit are lower elevation forests, simply because the climate and access is there. Most of those lower elevation forests were, say, 150 years ago more, savannas. They tended to be grassy. And there were large trees stuck in it, and pockets of denser trees where it was wetter or protected, but primarily relatively open relatively mature trees, and primarily grass. Grass is what carried the fire. And uh, we changed that. Um, we removed the grass by introducing livestock in mm -hmm. huge numbers. We removed a major source of ignition by removing the American Indian. And then after that was gone, we uh, began fighting fires. We created public lands, and then on those lands, we began suppressing any fire which happens. So we remove fire out of that system. So that's like changing the rainfall regime. Those systems don't behave the same way anymore, and the forests have become overgrown, uh, much denser, and hence more prone to violent kinds of fires. Now that's a, 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 an overview, but it's generally true. Now, if you take those conditions, and now we start putting houses in, we've also changed the way we live on the land. We're not living primarily as a rural people. We're not living off a rural economy. We're not, we're not 
pruning the trees, plowing the ground, uh, burning, grazing, planting, harvesting, doing all of those kinds of things, which could have the effect of opening it up and in some ways protecting the developments because you're using them. Uh, it's essentially an urban recolonization of the rural landscape. People have urban values, urban expectations, urban aesthetics, and we are allowing sort of the matter and antimatter of this sort of <laughs> untreated <laughs> wildland to merge cheek to jowl with urban developments, and that is a very unstable compound. So we shouldn't be surprised that we have a little excitement from time to time. Now you can do that again in you know, much of the Northeast. You can do it in the Ohio Valley. It doesn't make any difference. But if you are in a fire-prone area, it does. So again, there's not a universal prescription. Having dense woods next to wooden houses is not a problem in a lot of the country. It is a problem here. I want to talk about um, <clears throat> a, a episode, or a, a, actually I want to call it a tragedy. I guess it was 1909 or 1910, the Great Fire in the Northwest. Oh, yeah. Uh, that was before we have the population we do today and the settlements we do. What made that one to be so mammoth, uh, whereas fires since then have been, uh, they've been serious, but not of that magnitude. Well, a lot of things came together. It was, uh, it was a dry year. Actually, the winter was above normal, but then it turned dry in April and didn't work back. Um, you had a lot of ignition uh, from lightning, but most of the ignitions were from railroads. Uh, trains were notorious. Uh, by far the greatest preponderance of fires were started by trains and along tracks. You had the, Miss the uh, Milwaukee uh, railroad had punched its way over the bitter roots just the year before. There's lots of disturbed woods and uh, slash around, lots of uh, embers coming out. So that's part of it. You have a series of, of uh, weather and wind events, not unlike last summer, with the exception that in 1910, August 20 and 21st, you have a huge wind, cold front passing with uh, gale force winds and acting on the landscape in that way created what, what was known as uh, the big blow up. So you probably, I mean, numbers are hard to come by, but two and a half to three million acres burned in the northern Rockies that summer. Perhaps two thirds of that occurred in that one episode at the end of the season. Now, you also don't have a very effective fire fighting mm -hmm. system. The Forest Service was barely five years old as a functioning body. It was filled with young guys. They had thought the 1908 season, which was tough, was, was the standard, where they in for a surprise. Uh, and they really didn't know what they were doing. And I don't, I don't mean that cynically. I mean that nobody had ever tried to fight fires on what is essentially an uninhabited land, a chunk of public land from which settlement is more or less excluded. Uh, and you were going to have to create a firefighting system to take charge of that mission. And uh, you know they, they rallied thousands and thousands, between five, maybe up to 9,000 firefighters were hired and, and sent out, 33 company of regular army, essentially the entire standing army of the US. Uh, from the Presidio to the Dakotas was called out in fighting fires. It was the first real firefight. And uh, they got pounded. Uh, they lost 78 firefighters during the big blow up in seven different incidents, not one giant crew. Uh, the Forest Service spent nearly a million dollars over budget. That was real money back then. It was the first time that this sort of emergency funding had been tried. The 1910 fires were the first for a lot of things. It really gave us the sort of the founding story. It's the Iliad, the Song of Roland of, of American firefighters. Now that we've had <coughs> almost a century <coughs> since that happened, what, what kind of things have we learned? What kind of effect did that have upon those lands? Well, uh, it had a lot of, uh, of consequence. Uh, the, the thing about the 1910 fires is not just that they were big or lethal, which they were, uh, but that they were influential. And a lot of that was the timing of it. A young organization, this was sort of the long march for this. The next. All the next chief foresters up through 1939 were personally on the fires. I mean, they carried that with them. That was their standard. So it gets embedded in the agency and its, its expectations. But also in the middle of all this, there is a ferocious debate. 
it goes public. And it's, it's another version of uh, this political quarrel between Gifford Pinchot and Secretary of Interior Richard Ballinger. Pinchot had been fired for insubordination early in 1910 because he wouldn't leave Ballinger alone. And he was determined to vindicate himself by driving Ballinger out of office, which he eventually did. But each man took a different position on forest protection. Pinchot argued that firefighting, ultimately fire exclusion on a European and sort of imperial model, was what Americans had to do on the public lands. Ballinger was much closer to sort of frontier rural America. He said, no, what we need to do is to follow the Indian way, as it was called, and light burn. But if in these lower elevation forests, the pines and the rest, we regularly burned it out under controlled conditions, lightly burned it, we would not have these huge eruptions. So the debate that we're still flashing yeah, out, I mean, we haven't solved it. That occurred in the midst of this trauma. Sunset Magazine, for heaven's sakes, is publishing articles in favor of light burning. Ballinger is quoted in the New York Times press release after the big blow up. We, this shows that the Forest Service failed. We need a different strategy. But that is caught up in this very deep, schismatic, political fight that eventually splits the Republican Party. And that's how deeply embedded. So the fires were seen as an overt test. And because of that, the whole debate was skewed that you had to choose Pinchot and everything Pinchot said and represented, or you had to choose Ballinger and the rest. It was a false dichotomy, and we're still struggling to overcome that. And that was just early in the show today when you talked about not having a, a policy that fits all forests or all parts of the country. But from that, those debates in the early part of the 20th century, we, we still have that, that argument whether we will have a one policy. Right. One policy, and we're still arguing about whether about the choice. We're either going to fight fires or light them, and that's it. And so we've seen the Park Service in some ways sort of tried to invert the old story. Well, if, if excluding fire caused problems, if we put it back in, that will reverse it, and it will bring us back to where we are. Well, no, it doesn't. Again, fire only acts on what's out there. And if you've got overgrown crummy forests, you get overgrown crummy fires. And uh, you know they lost two fires a year ago, one at the Bandelier and one at Grand Canyon, and uh, with horrendous consequences. Why were they pushing the limits under extreme conditions? Why was it so important? Because we've defined it. We either have to do one or the other. And I would argue that the time has come after the inability to stop wildfire in a serious way last summer and the inability to conduct prescribed burning in a serious way without billion dollar damages, that maybe the whole argument is misphrased. That maybe the time to do is to think about the larger context and not just say, take a kind of ingenuity approach. We have to do one or the other. We have to start them or stop them. End of discussion. I hear you saying it's more complex. It's not that there's too much a simplistic approach to it. Yeah, yeah very much. And I, I mean, fire, fire, I mean, you can look at any given fire and you will see different effects in different parts of that single fire. I mean, fire takes, takes on the character of, of its surroundings. So you have to be much more nuanced in thinking about it. And we have to be much more specific about how we want it and why and what limits it. Janelle Burton. So are you suggesting then that we need to have plans for various areas in advance? Well, you certainly need plans and in advance, but I'm not convinced I don't see this as a policy problem. In many ways, we've had policy for 20 or 30 years for some of the federal agencies, and we haven't seen commensurate results on the ground, in my opinion. And I think part of it is the way we do prescribe burning, and part of that is a legal and liability context and all the regulatory things. I mean, you've got endangered species, clean air, clean water, uh, tort. I mean, you, you start adding it up, and you, you wonder you can never do anything. Uh, but I also think there are practical matters of dealing with prescribed fire as a kind of set piece. It's a fire fight stood on its head. And I don't think that's a formula for, for doing that kind of burning. I think you have to be much more opportunistic. You have to, I would basically just follow the snows up the mountain, burning in bits and pieces. In many, many lands, you're going to have to do some serious weeding and treatment, not logging, as we usually think that, but something so that the fire can take on the personality you want. It will do the biological work you want it to do. Right now it can't. It will do whatever is out there. Um, 
I think we just uh, kind of fire foraging. So I, I think the way in which we conduct it needs to be rethought. But I also think the problem is not policy so much as poetry. And after studying the 1910 fire, one of the, af one of the consequences of that was that it created a great story, created a great saga about firefighting and why we should care, why we should pursue this. Most of the American public was not interested in spending huge amounts of money fighting fires in the backcountry. Why did it matter? Uh, the 1910 fire gave the agencies a reason why it mattered and one that they could explain to the public eventually. And that's what I think is lacking for a, a new fire program. It's not just enough to say, well, we can't continue to suppress all fires, and clearly we can't burn everything in sight, but those are all negative things. They're telling what, what you can't do. We don't have a motivating story to tell us what we really want to come out of it and why we'll overcome all these individual hurdles to get there. So you're, you're suggesting a proactive rather than a reactive uh, a, uh, uh, um, response to whatever is happening. You're, you're yeah. actually suggesting more of a proactive approach. Absolutely. And, and that yeah. would work for, particularly for those folks who have their own property, their own private property, they have a house on the property. Yeah. Uh, they can do some things then, I'm taking it from what you're saying, uh, spring of the year would be a good time to be out there working on your, your particular um, forest. That's right, spring cleaning. Um, absolutely, and I, I actually, we have a, a house that borders the Apache National Forest, which is actually in a very fire-prone uh, place. And we're in a subdivision, and frankly, uh, the feds don't need any policy to deal with that, uh, that community. Everything that needs to be done, we can do. I mean, take care of the roofing, clean up around the house, thinning out uh, the place. I mean, you don't have to pave it over or anything like that. Putting in a respectable roads so you've got access. Uh, they even created a volunteer fire department. It's an unincorporated town. They've done that. So the, the feds weren't necessary for it. We don't need a great federal program. Uh, the, the local Forest Service has been helpful in providing advice and working with it, but that's an individual responsibility. And cleaning out brush is important. Yes, it is. And, and in fact, uh, you know, again, there were many kinds of fires. The study of the uh, houses that burned, the hundreds of houses that burned in Los Alamos, I mean, the image is that we see the fires, the photographs are mid midday, maximum burning, huge walls of flame going through there, and your sense is that that's what scoured out the town. No, most of those were done at night by surface fires. And what carried the fire to the house was not this tidal wave of, of wind and flame, it was just pine needles, leaves, litter, that just took it right up to the edge of the house. And because it had been evacuated, there was no one there uh, to stop it. Now, I may be over reading the reports, but I mean, my sense is that you, know, you could have stopped a lot of those with a squirt gun and a whisk broom if somebody had been there to do that. So had it been a huge crown fire, you couldn't have. But even minor cleaning there probably could have saved a great fraction of those, of those houses. So there are lots of things you can do. We don't have to wait for anybody to tell us what to do with or start a program or create a policy. You just take care of your property. Now, before I go back to Tony, I want to give you a chance to tell our viewers again your, about your books and what each one, uh, the title <laughs> of each one, uh, and what each one addresses. All right. Well, I, I, won't, I won't do that. This is my 13th book. Um, okay. So, well, basically, all the books I've done go back to my experience on the North Rim, and they deal with places, how places became important. I, I knew why the Grand Canyon mattered to me. I grew up there. Essentially, I lived there. I didn't know why all these millions of other people kept coming. So I studied the creation of, of meaning and place. The canyon, uh, the ice was about Antarctica, things like that. And the rest deal with fire. And so I've written histories of fire in the US, Australia, uh, Europe. I did a world survey. Uh, I've got a textbook in two editions and so forth. Uh, the latest book, though, goes back to this question of story and how, what its role is in shaping national uh, fire identities, if you will. And it's called Year of the Fires, the Story of the Great Fires of 1910. And it is a narrative. It's framed by the, poli the politics of it, because that's what elevated those fires out of just an, a Western oddity, a freak of Western nature, and made it a national issue. But it's basically an account of 
of the refinery. And in that book, you talk about Wallace, Idaho. Oh, yes. Wallace was the area of the St. Joe Mountains between Wallace and, and Avery was really ground zero. Uh, there were 1,800 firefighters and two companies of the 25th Infantry when the blow-up occurred, and that is where uh, 72 of the firefighters died in different incidents, but many lived. I mean, there were 1,800 out there. So nearly 1,800 survived, and their stories are often just as compelling. In your book, uh, How the Canyon <coughs> Became Great, what is it about the Grand Canyon that is, you, you're, you have a great advantage because you, you <laughs> live there and you know it well. It fascinates people from all over the world as they visit it. Well, I think there, there's a, certainly a natural grandeur, but, but aesthetics is very much in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. And the story of the canyon is the story of how a group of people created meaning and created a kind of appreciation for scenery that had been seen over and again and ignored. I mean, the Grand Canyon was one of the first natural wonders of the New World to be discovered by Europeans. The Spanish were there in 1540 and had nothing to say about it. Uh, it was a barrier. They, they couldn't, it was, had no meaning. But by the middle of the 19th century, lots of things come together. America's search for nationalism, our, our use of nature to replace cultural monuments, uh, uh, tradition of exploring. Lots of things converge, art and science. And suddenly the canyon finds people who are, uh, in a sense, willing to invest it. Here's where all these themes come together. On that note, I have to bring the program to conclusion on behalf <laughs> okay. of Janelle Burke and our staff, uh, Dr. Stephen Pine. Thank you. Uh, the clock always wins, and we didn't have enough That's time. Fine. Your, your <laughs> comments were fascinating, and, and I'm, I'm sure our viewers will enjoy it immensely because I learned so much today about that it's so much more complex, and, I, and I'm sure that will be helpful uh, to those who have any role to play in the process. And good luck in your work, and thank you again for coming by our college and our campus for this most enlightening interview. Well, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, as I said, our guests have been Dr. Stephen Pine uh, talking about the environment as it relates to a review of the management of our forests in this country. And I hope you've enjoyed the program as much as we've enjoyed bringing it to you. And I would invite you to join us again next week. At that time, uh, we will move to a, a new issue, as we do from uh, week to week. And uh, please be with us then. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest-running entirely college-produced program on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us again at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station.